for coming out tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. And I spoke, I don't know, what was it, 18 months ago or something here about climate change. And I, I realized that um, when I gave that presentation, I had a lot of science in it. And I think that, you know, a lot of it kind of flew over people's heads. So I, I, what I'd like to do tonight, you know, is kind of two things. One is to um, get everybody familiar with what climate change is and some of the terminology. So I put some of the these pages on the seats here because um, a lot of people don't understand what sequestration is or how that happens or uh, what a carbon footprint is or even what carbon is. Is carbon good? Is it bad? It's, neither. Um, so um, I'm, I'm a chemist by training, so I, I kind of geek out on the science, so excuse me while I do that. But I want to give you a good grounding in it so that you understand it. And I think that if, if you understand it better, you'll, you know, get more engaged and, and maybe care more about it. I, you know, that's maybe an uh, overstatement. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the talk I gave, you know, some time ago was, as I said, more of a, uh, making the case for, you know, climate change. But really, I think where people are struggling is, one, to understand it, but also emotionally, this is the second point, emotionally, it's a lot of stuff to deal with. It's, um, and this is how I got to this talk tonight, is that about two years ago, I was, I was kind of despondent uh, about, because I, I get this barrage of information every day about ocean acidification and, you know, the wildfires and in California and here. Um, you know, the, the loss of species and, and loss of biodiversity, we're losing insects, we're losing pollinators, we're, there's just a lot of loss, and that loss is grief. Um, and I was grieving for our planet. <laughs> and through, a, you know, some training that, uh, through the Land Trust uh, Alliance, and just sort of going through this journey on my own, I, I thought, you know, we need to talk about it because it's, it's important um, in my mind. Um, and quite frankly, um, as humans, we, it's about our survival. Um, and, and we really have to think about the systems that support our survival and not be disconnected from nature. I mean, we are part of nature. We need to understand it, and we need to understand our place in it. So with that, I'm just gonna I'm gonna try to go through these slides. I have too many slides, so I'll try to go through them quickly. But you know, there's all of these things that are happening right now um, is really you know there's a sense of urgency and and there's all these uh, you know fisheries are declining, sea levels rising, or you know crop yields are down, uh, severe weather events, and um, you know it, it's just really very disturbing. Um, this goes out 650,000 years. Um, I've seen another one that goes out 800,000 years. And the CO2 level for most of this never rose above 300 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is a naturally occurring uh, chemical in our in our lives we each of us breathes out two pounds of co2 every day so every living thing produces co2 um, if we did not have co2 in our atmosphere we would freeze to death it creates a blanket around the earth that holds in the heat from the sun reflects <coughs> off and it bounces back to the earth if we did not have CO2, we would freeze to death because space is really, really, really cold. And so, you know, we need some CO2 in our atmosphere. It's why we have life on Earth. Plants take it up and make solid carbon. And I'll get into that more later. But as you can see at the very 
tail end of this. Um, here is the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> starting in Britain and, you know, sort of going around the world. And it has shot up at this crazy, unprecedented level. Um, and we don't really see where it's going to end yet. It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going up. And the problem with that is that this blanket has turned into a down comforter or an electric blanket, you know, on the planet. It's, it's getting so hot, um, it's melting ice on the poles. It's all of our, our glaciers are melting. Um, there's methane that has been trapped in the permafrost in the Arctic for, I don't, who knows how long, uh, a really long time. And it's literally boiling out of the, you know, it's methane's boiling out of the, the ground in these lakes because the, the ice has melted and now there's lakes. So um, I, I just want to illustrate that, you know, this is rising really fast. This is increasing temperature and that's increasing CO2 levels. And from 1880 to our current state, um, the temperature is rising with CO2 increasing in our atmosphere. Um, and, and we don't know how hot this will get. 2016 was the hottest year on record human history. Um, actually, probably even, you know, I don't know if they can, in the ice cores, if they can measure that as well. But, um, and 2019 was the second hottest year. So, you know, this is not a good trend that we, we have going on here. Okay, so where is this coming from, or who's generating this? Um, this is fairly recent data. And, um, you know, people uh, say, oh, it's, it's China. China's the problem. But uh, I'll, I'll sort of counter that a little bit. Um, right here, I think, is about 2006. And during the early 2000s, uh, America lost about almost 6 million manufacturing jobs, primarily to China. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just, so probably what happened is that all of that manufacturing went to China. They have no environmental pollution controls. They're using coal to generate all of their electricity to support all this industry. And, they, they just shot up with all of this new manufacturing capacity that they took on, primarily from the United States, but also from other places. The other one that I want to focus on on the far side is, yes, China is a problem, and they don't have the environmental regulations that those jobs or those industries had in the United States. But on a per capita basis, so every one of us in this room far exceeds every other country in the amount of CO2 that we generate every year. So people say, ah, it's a, you know, these other countries are a problem. Yes, it, it, it is a problem. But we are very much part of that problem because every one of us generates more CO2 per year than any other population in the, in the world. And cumulatively, um, I think probably North America and Europe um, probably have, you know, also exceed far more than what China or India has contributed since, uh, there's a year on there, 1751. I don't know why they chose that number, but, <laughs> but um, so yes. I would say that we are part of the problem, but everybody's part of the problem, too. So where does all of this CO2 come from? Um, primarily, it comes from three major sources. The biggest one is electricity generation, which really supports a number of these things that are kind of stacked on top of it. But the greatest, the greatest contribution to CO2 generation in the, in the United States, actually everywhere in the world, uh, power generation is number one, is just for electricity. 
Um, and we talk about transportation, how we move goods around and services, and then just industry, the, the manufacturing uh, core. On top of that, there's a smaller band for agriculture, uh, commercial activity, and then residential is, is one of the smallest ones. So um, the world that I live in is down here, and that's where uh, the, the land and, and forestry actually soak up. They're a sink for CO2. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, is that we need to reduce these things on top, and if we can, create more capacity to soak up the CO2 that's being generated. Um, I want to go back to that just for a second, because I found myself a little confused. Electricity generation is just making electricity, but then that's a response to the demand of residential, commercial, and all these other All groups, of those things right? on top, yeah. So, Really, if it you're using a lot of electricity in your house, you're partly making the pink zone bigger too. Correct. Okay. Yeah. But there are other things that are using that more of that pink zone. Probably. Yeah. I would say. And also, there's residential use, like if you use um, natural gas or heating oil in your house to heat your house and uh, cook your food, um, that goes in the orange, but not in the orange. Correct, because it's not electricity generation. Oh, right. Yeah, that's yeah. just for making electricity. Okay, so I'll get back to that a little bit later, but the one thing, uh, there's some things on your chairs, uh, these little sheets here, and I want to go through some of this, the terminology, because I want to make sure that every, a lot of people say, oh yeah, I understand it, and they, they may not, you know, they're kind of embarrassed to say that they don't understand it, so. <laughs> so I'm just going to do this. And this actually comes from a lot of questions that I've gotten from people. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I, there's no shame, you know. It's like, you've got a question, just shout it out, because I, I think we all need to, to understand the terminology. So... And this, this first one was what I got from one person, is it good or is it bad? And it, it's, it's, it's neither. It's, you know, that's a judgment call. Um, I'll get into this in the, in the, the very bottom, but um, we're, we're, almost everything around us uh, contains carbon. Um, we are a big piece of carbon. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's an element. So it's, it's pervasive, it's in rocks, it's in human bodies, it's in your dog. Um, but it depends on what form it's in. Um, so it can be a liquid, a solid, or a gas. So floating around in this room and what we breathe out every day of two pounds of CO2 every day is a gas. It's this gas that comes out of us as we, I'm spewing, CO2 out, all of us are, even as we, we speak. It's a natural part of our metabolism. So it's, it's not bad, um, but uh, it, it can also form as in a liquid. Um, you know, in, in terms of climate change, uh, CO2 as a gas can dissolve into seawater um, because of the the natural distribution of, of things dissolving into, uh, you know, sort of equilibrium. Um, and that makes carbonic acid when CO2 dissolves into salt water. And that's causing ocean acidification. So people, you know, making the connection between too much CO2 in the atmosphere and how does the ocean turn acid? is because it, the CO2 dissolves and, and there's a chemical reaction that happens in the seawater and it makes carbonic acid and that's, that you know, decreases the pH and causes all kinds of, of problems. So that's how it gets into a liquid. Okay, how does it get into a solid? Uh, you know, I'll talk about photosynthesis and some other things, but um, a, all, all plants uh, take the gas, CO2 gas, and they convert it into a solid, wood. And I'll, I'll talk about how this happens, but this is, this is how things get sequestered. There's a much 
higher density of carbon in this than there is floating around in the, in the air. So it gets concentrated when it forms a solid. And it becomes much more stable, and it, that's what we're going to talk about with se sequestration. So I'm probably getting out of order here. Uh, like I said, everything generates CO2 that's living, but also from natural sources, um, like burning fossil fuels. Um, also, uh, you'll see this term GHG, and that stands for greenhouse gases. So CO2 is one greenhouse gas. There's a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, there's methane, there's fluorocarbon type uh, uh, gases, there's uh, nitrous oxide, I believe it is, anyway, the nitrogen uh, and oxygen. Um, so anyway, oh, so these are, these are things that cause um, part of the problem. It only causes a problem when they're out of balance. Like I said, we need some CO2 and greenhouse gases to heat our planet. So uh, what does carbon sequestration mean? Okay, essentially it's taking this gaseous forms floating around in the air and it gets con converted into these solid forms. Um, and nature does this best uh, by far and away. Um, it has a very efficient mechanism of taking CO2 gas and, and creating solid wood. Um, and so that's one of the best ways to sequester carbon is in any type of plant material. Um, it can also be stored in the ocean. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, what do I want to call, uh, you know, phytoplankton in the, in the ocean. They also use a lot of, of uh, CO2. Um, also, there, as I said, there's nitrogen in the, in the atmosphere. There's certain types of plants that will take nitrogen out of the air and fix it into the soil. They're called nitrogen fixing uh, plants. And this is, these are fantastic plants because they're essentially putting fertilizer um, into the soil. So clover, legumes, those types of plants. And that's called nitrogen fixation. So that's another type of gas that is taken out of the atmosphere and is sequestered. Soil is a fantastic place to sequester all of these atmospheric gases. All right, so I've also been to what is a carbon footprint? Okay, so um, getting back to that previous graph where you have per capita the number, you know, the amount of CO2 that, that is generated per person in those different countries, um, that's how much through uh, not only of you breathing your two pounds of CO2 every day, but what do you use as resources, driving around in your car, um, the, the products that you buy that are, that are made out of, say, plastic or any number of things that also produce CO2. So that is your carbon footprint. So it's your total amount of what you do individually every year. Um, and then lastly, how does this gas get converted into a very stable solid form? So this is called photosynthesis, hope you've heard of it. Um, it's what plants do, and I'll just kind of, I'll kind of skip ahead here. So plants take CO2, which is carbon dioxide, um, and combined with water, which is H2O, those two, two elements combine. You put some solar radiation in there to power it. There's little, great little factories, enzyme factories and plants, and chloroplasts that, that contain chlorophyll. They're the, sort of the en enzyme uh, activity that converts these two very basic things into, it's called sugars, but it's essentially solid um, carbon. And this is, these are the, the sugars are the building blocks for everything in a plant. 
leaves, stems, roots. Um, and then also a wonderful byproduct for all of this to survive is that plants produce oxygen as a byproduct. So we need plants not only to take the CO2 out of the air, but also to provide oxygen to us for us to survive. So um, I'm going to go back to this one. Um, so this is, yeah, people say, oh, we need to develop technologies to take CO2 out of the air. It's like we have the most efficient, effective way for dealing with, with CO2 in our atmosphere. And it is the most efficient. We don't have to develop it. It's wor working right now. Um, but we need to optimize it. We need to find ways for us to make sure that we don't degrade these systems any further, but also increase their efficiency in forests, in building soil that can sequester just massive amounts of CO2. And oh, by the way, you also increase the fertility of the soil at the same time. This is why I like regenerative agriculture is just spot on. Um, and then also wetlands and things like that are very efficient at storing carbon and, and sort of keeping this sequestered. So this is this sequestration is really what the natural systems do um, to hold carbon in a more stable form. Yes, it does degrade eventually, but it degrades so much slower and it actually soaks up all of this CO2 from the atmosphere. So, um, and by the way, the fact that plants produce oxygen, we absolutely need them. <laughs> um, there, I, I don't have all the calculations for how much oxygen that we need every day, but it's pretty tremendous. Um, so, how efficient is this system? In one year, one acre of healthy, mature forest, things that are like 30, 40 years old, can convert six tons of CO2 into, into solid carbon. So six tons of CO2 in an acre of, of mature, healthy forest, and it releases four tons of oxygen. This is an incredibly effective system, and we really need to make sure that we protect these systems and really try to augment them. So what are these systems? I'm going to call them natural climate solutions. I have one question. Yes. Is it a mature forest? Is a growing forest less uh, able to sequester? Yes. Because it's growing. It's growing and it's actually producing more CO2 than it's sequestering. So there's kind of a, a, a change at the 30, 40 year mark for trees that they sequester more carbon than they produce because they're living organisms too. They have a metabolism and they produce, but as they get bigger and older, they are able to sort of tip that balance to, you know, sort of a, a sink. So they, they, they become even more of a sink. Unfortunately, that's usually when trees are harvested. So, um, you, know, you know, that's a, it's another topic we can talk about another time, but. Um, so, these three areas, uh, forests, agriculture and grasslands and wetlands, are these natural systems that are exquisitely effective in sucking up all of the CO2. Um, wetlands are, per acre, the most intense sequesterers of carbon, I'll, I'll say. That's a word. Um, uh, but we just don't have very much of those acres. So on an acre per acre uh, sort of tally, forests are the most effective because we have more acres of forest. Agriculture and grasslands, if they're managed to sequester and not degrade um, those lands, they can be very effective in uh, sequestering carbon. It depends on how they're managed. Um, which brings up, well, I'll get to it in a minute. So, I, I think I'm going to skip through these things, but forest, reforestation, avoid forest conversion, 
uh, promoting urban reforestation, uh, improving plantation management, um, for agriculture and grasslands, cover crops, uh, nutrient management, their grazing optimization is a big one, um, and, and planting legumes and pastures that increase the fertility of the soil as well as augmenting the soil at right. And then for wetlands, um, if we can restore tidal wetlands, uh, they can sequester a lot more carbon, peatlands in some of the areas of the world. Seagrass is a great one. Um, and we're losing a lot of seagrass from our oceans with the ocean acidification that's going on. So these are three key natural systems that help us keep our planet in balance. So I thought, OK, what's an example of this? Um, our land trust manages about 820 acres of mature forest. Now, I'll say these trees are probably 50 years and older. So they're sinks. They're, they're the type of trees, um, and, and some of them are 80, 100 years old. Um, I thought, OK, well, how much does our, our little 820 acres of maturing forest sequester? So. In one year, um, those trees pull 10 million pounds of CO2 out of the atmosphere, just on the lands that we manage on the south coast. It converts the CO2, that 10 million pounds, into 3 million pounds of solid carbon. So it concentrates it and keeps it in a stable form. And it also produces 7 million pounds of oxygen. So even, so, you know, conservation can be a really great tool for looking at, at ways to sequester carbon. So everybody says, okay, what does a, a one-ton tree look like? You know, there's this little person here. So that's a sycamore tree. That's the only one I could find that said, this is this weighs one ton. So <laughs> anyway, but it gives you an idea of, of sort of the size of tree or bigger um, that that can do this work for us. All right, and I, I was talking about regenerative uh, agriculture before. This is one of the areas that is so exciting right now is that farmers are finding that they use a bunch of different techniques to manage their land, whether it's uh, row crops or uh, the Wall family uh, has sheep um, on the Elk River. Um, this is an incredible opportunity, I will say, to put soil production or soil augmentation or, or soil sequestration uh, into just high gear. Um, a lot of, it, on, on Fridays, the USDA features, um, you know, families and family farms, and, and this is one day, it was, a, you know, regenerative fa farming, and, and they're growing corn. So, um, there's no-till practices, and, and a number of different types of farming for row crops, cover crops, you know, like clover and legumes. Um, the Wall family are, are sheep ranchers, and it is absolutely amazing to go out to their farm and look at what they have done. They have sold a whole bunch of their farm equipment because they don't need to put hay away for their sheep. They have increased the productivity of their grasslands so exponentially that they have three times as many animals on a vastly smaller footprint of acreage. So I think Pete said there were like a thousand sheep that they can maintain on 19 acres of land, which is kind of mind-blowing. It's very high concentration. But the way they manage them, they move them every day, and they plant these cover crops that increase um, the productivity and the nutritious value that's delivered to the sheep. And their sheep are, they have more sheep and they're healthier. Uh, they use less antibiotics, less deworming things. Um, 
they don't have to irrigate their land anymore either. They, they're all their, they, don't, they don't use their irrigation. Because those roots have gone so deep into the ground, they don't need to use irrigation. Did you do regenerative farming on an industrial level? Because that's where most of our <laughs> Sure. I mean, there's um, no-till practices are, are one of the ways that you could do that. Um, just tilling the soil releases a phenomenal amount of, of carbon dioxide. So, anyway, I just want to, I think a lot of people demonize agriculture as being such a huge part of the problem, and I think it, it depends. Um, there's a lot of people that are moving towards this regenerative agriculture. It's, it's hugely impactful. So it not only makes uh, you know, good sense for our, our climate, but it's it makes good business sense. They don't have to irrigate. They don't have to, you know. There's all these. They haven't spread um, urea, the, the the nitrogen containing fertilizer, on their land for six or seven years. They don't need to fertilize anymore. That stuff's expensive. So it makes great business sense once you get your your system set up for this. More animals per acre, increased fertility um, of the land and the animals. They're healthier. You don't have to irrigate. You don't have to have all these inputs. It's incredibly impactful and I'm really excited about this. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to summarize this, these natural systems. If we optimize them, we can really do some impactful work for, for mitigating climate change. But it, it's going to take a lot of time, effort, education, and really trying to change people's minds about how they manage their land and their livestock. Yeah? So you're saying that raising sheep is a good thing in the program. Now, raising cattle. Yeah. I hear a lot of bad news about raising cattle. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because it, it kind of goes back to their biology. They have like extra stomachs and they <laughs> ferment in their stomachs and then they belch out all this methane. It doesn't come out the other end, it comes out of their mouths. And, um, but sheep have a different system, so they don't produce that methane like cows do. And the other great thing about sheep is that they they grow wool that's shorn off every year. That's a great carbon sequestration mechanism is just through the, the hair that they produce. <laughs> so um, I'm kind of, you know, I don't eat very much beef anymore. I'll go into, you know, some of the changes that I've made personally. But I eat lamb and I eat the Walls family lamb because they do it right. <laughs> and I can get it. They sell it. So. You know, I really think that this is, you know, and I, I, I don't eat as much meat as I used to, but I still like meat. But I, I really have, I've just gone over and I, I've focused on, you know, you know, the sort of more friendly forms of, of meat. So, anyway, I, I'll, I'll not belabor this further. Okay, I'm going to transition into getting into sort of the... The challenging aspects, you know, and I'll just say emotionally of dealing with, with climate change. And this really goes back to, like I say, my own personal challenges of depression and anxiety when I would think about the planet and, and uh, fear, because it is very real. Um, but then kind of apathy, to, or anger, anger is definitely in there. Um, but apathy, too, it's just like you, you just, it's so overwhelming, you just don't feel like you can do anything. And I don't want us to be in that place. We don't need to be in that place. So I'm going to try to talk you through some things that will make you help, help you deal with this. But I love this quote. This kind of turned my head around. I'll read it to you. Um, we scientists don't know how to do that, and I'll get to that. I used to think the top environmental problems where biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that within 30 years of good science, we could address those problems using science. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual 
and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. So they are throwing science at us left and right because that's all they know how to do. But what we need to do as a culture, as communities, as individuals, is that we need to figure out what is broken in this system and we need to fix it. Because our survival as humans depends on this. All right, and this is a great uh, New Yorker. You know, I want to take out one of those mortgages on my grandchildren's future. And that's kind of what we're doing. Um, I don't have any children, so I'm not going to have any grandchildren. I don't think that matters. I care deeply about what is happening to our planet, and I hope you will too, because if you have children um, and grandchildren, you need to look them in the eye and say, you know, we need to turn this around, and how are we going to do that? So one of the great books that I read that really helped me kind of deal with, it, it's really kind of a moral issue, I would say. Um, but it, much more of it, uh, it goes deeper than that. But um, it's called Great Tide Rising. It's by Kathleen Dean Moore. And, um, you know, I was reading Naomi Klein, and I just wanted, like, to slit my wrists. And I'm like, oh, it's just so <laughs> depressing. I just, like, can't read that. It's so depressing. So this one, especially towards the end, it, it talks about... Um, taking joy and taking care of the planet. And I, I, I was like, oh, who's talking about joy and the, you know, the climate change? You know? But she really brings you around into focusing on, you know, yes, it's depressing. Yes, it creates anxiety. Yes, it's fearful. You're angry and you have apathy. But there's also this great tide of people that is rising up and they're saying, I want to do something, and I, I'm hoping that we can sort of find things for you to do that really resonate with you. It feels so good, I, and, and this is from my own personal kind of come around on this, is that I'm, I'm much more hopeful. Um, you know, 300 years ago, we did not have this horrible CO2 problem. It was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's only been 300 years. You know, look at that 600,000 timeline that we had. You know, if it, if it happens that, quick, that fast, we can turn it around, too. Um, I, I feel very confident of that. And you might think I'm crazy, but that's all right. Um, anyway, great book to read if you're struggling. Um, so, you know, what can we do? I'm going to try to transi transition us into what we can do. Get good information. Uh, use science-based data, not, not someone's agenda or interpretation of the data. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good science out there. And I'm kind of beyond the science. I said, yeah, it's here. I know how to fix it. I'm doing conservation work. That works. So that's what I'm focusing on. But I'm also making personal changes, too. So um, understand you know, how to reduce greenhouse gases. Let's reduce our carbon footprints. Um, let's change our relationship with the planet. And one thing that I'm most disturbed about is people think we're humans. We're outside of this natural system. And everything that's happening in the world is, doesn't really involve us. It's just something that's happening out in the world. And it's not. I mean, we are part of nature. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading, natural history reading and talking about all of the fossils of human species that have come and gone before us. We have had extinctions before. We're in the sixth mass extinction of the Earth. This is serious business. And this is us. We could go extinct. I don't want that to happen. And it doesn't have to happen. So let's explore that. But we've lost our connection to nature. 
Um, and I think that people just just don't think that they're they're part of this problem. So I want you to reconnect to nature. I want you to reconnect to your morals. What is important to you? Um, and, and you know, do that work. Uh, and be morally consistent with your convictions. And I'll just say that, you know, I am not a perfect person. You know, I will break down and have a cheeseburger once in a while. <laughs> but um, I think that if we all put an oar in the water, you know, we can all kind of paddle us up to a, all right, that's probably not a metaphor, but um, I, I think that we need to say, okay, um, I, you know, whatever the, the issue is, I just want you to explore what you do in your life and how maybe you might do things a little bit different. So, like I said, Great Tide Rising, fantastic book. If you want to learn about soil sequestration, the Soil Will Save Us is like the best book. It's so readable. And it, it brings you deep into how we can augment soil to sequester a fantastic amount of carbon. And we have degraded our soils all over the planet. It's, it's kind of sad. Um, but they can be brought back. And, I, and someone uh, pointed me to, in the direction of this uh, paper that said, if we grew, you know, if we reclaim, you know, increase the soil depth by, you know, I don't know, a foot, uh, around the world, we would have like not enough CO2 in the atmosphere. That's how much soil can hold. So this is something that we can do in our yards. Uh, it's not something that somebody else has to do someplace else. We can do this at home. Um, so I uh, strongly recommend that book. Great. Okay. Um, this is in the in Get Informed piece of it is read. I'm a huge reader. But there's films, too. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, if you want to learn about climate change before the flood, that, that's another kind of disturbing one. Living the change is how people are living around the world. They're actually living differently. They're doing different types of agriculture. They're growing their own food. Um, the one I like the best is called 100,000 Beating Hearts. And it's some good old boy in Georgia. I used to live in, in, in Georgia for 12 years. And this guy is, you know, you, you think it's sort of like quintessential redneck type of guy. It's southern farmer. And he has embraced um, regenerative agriculture to just an incredible proportion. And I, I really, it, it's a great video. It's so inspiring and it's He's funny. Um, so I, I recommend that one. Okay, we've talked about dealing, right, with emotions, bad news. I do want to say is that, look around you, you're not alone. Um, all of us are, are concerned about it. If you're here tonight, you're probably concerned. Um, and I really want you to sort of take those sort of negative emotions and try to turn them around into action. And try to, to make a difference. It'll make you feel better. It really does. It makes you feel so much better that you're making a difference. Okay, but why is this so hard? How many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution? <laughs> it's okay, you can raise your hands. Yeah, everybody has. How many of you have failed? Um, change is hard. Why is it so hard? Uh, there's a number of, you know, we make excuses, this internal dialogue in your head, oh, this is so hard, I can't do this, I'm tired, I don't want to go to the gym this morning. Um, and that there's, a there's a whole bunch of different reasons why we change is so hard. It's because we're trying to change a habit. And a habit is an ingrained behavior. And, and you gotta kinda, gotta kind of fight your way through that. Um, but you can change your habits. It's just hard. 
So I'm just at the bottom, you know, be brave, tackle the hard things. Um, first of all, it will make you feel better. And if you stop, don't beat yourself up. I'm a recovering Catholic. Um, <laughs> I, I can guilt trip myself to, I'm a professional. Um, but just, just no guilt. Just, uh, okay, I, that did, I, I need to get back to doing that thing. And just get back to it. Um, so it's, it's hard to make changes. Um, but everything you do is going to make a difference. Um, and really there's some, uh, and, and this is one that I really want to harp on right here, is everybody in the world needs to be concerned about this. And it's so off-putting to have people judge you because you're eating a hamburger or I, I don't know what. Just don't judge people. Um, try to be kind and helpful and help educate them and be cooperative. Um, I don't care what religious stripe you are or what creed you follow. Um, be kind and helpful and cooperative and help people get through this challenge. It's hard. And everybody comes at it from a different place. So don't be preachy. Don't say that you know everything. I do not know everything. I'm just sharing with you my, my kind of journey here. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of move along here. Okay, I'm going to get back to this. So, yes, you can change your light bulbs in your house. Yes, do that. Um, but there's, there's these really big elephants in the room. Electricity generation, transportation, industry. These pervade a lot of the things that, you know, that we really need to address because these are the big elephants in the room. So I like this because this helps us rethink our, our consumption and um, you know refuse to consume certain things I like to vote with my pocketbook and I do it a lot um, reduce the amount of stuff you consume reuse repair you get recover at the very end of it recycle that should be your last thing that you do. But I think you need to re, you kind of need to reevaluate your approach to consumerism. Okay, so the thing, these are the things that I used for myself. It's like, okay, what do I buy and where does it come from? Where does it get transported from? And, and do I really need the stuff that I'm buying? Um, there's the, the want versus need. Um, you can reduce energy and transportation and just the amount of stuff that we buy. Um, our family has just given up on gifts. We don't give gifts anymore. It's like, I don't need more crap. You know? <laughs> Quite frankly, it's like, if I need something, my mom says, okay, here's your Christmas check. Go use that however you wish to use it. Um, you know, and, and maybe that's sort of crass, but, um, you know, uh, take your kid fishing or your grandchildren's fishing. Give them an experience instead of a, a, a tchotchke. Um, what do we eat? Uh, you know, beef is, you know, one of those things. Um, but where does that beef come from, or where does our food come from? Um, transportation costs for food is that huge, it's, it's huge. Um, I, uh, just this past year, got a farm share from Valley Flora. So you get a box of vegetables for 28 weeks or something. I'm a single person. It was 
a phenomenal challenge to eat that much produce in a week. But I did it. Because um, I didn't want to waste it. Food waste is another great thing. It's, you just don't want to do food waste. But that comes 10 miles from my house. It's delivered to the co-op. Um, like I said, I eat wall family lamb. That comes 10 miles. Look at where you source your food. Read those labels. Um, I challenge you to try to go to your farmer's markets. And keep those dollars here. I love when I pulled, I pulled some um, eggplant lasagna because I, oh God, I got so tired of all the eggplant that I got last year. <laughs> I just, there's so, only so much eggplant I can eat. But I pulled this out of the freezer because I froze half of it. And I, you know, it's like the tomatoes were from my friend Sylvia's yard. And the eggplant was from Valley Flora. And the cheese was from, I don't know, I got some ch local cheese, Face Rock, or I, I don't know where it was. But it was like, I, I know these people that produce my food. And it made me feel really good taking my leftover eggplant lasagna out of the freezer. Because I had a personal relationship with those people that produce that food. And don't forget to buy your fish at the... Exactly. The Sustainable uh, fisheries in Portland or at the docks or... Right here in yeah, the right here in the harbor, wherever you can get your food. That is huge. And it keeps us... Do get the eggs from the lady down the street that's got chickens. Keep those dollars here. I think it's a great economic development strategy. So, okay. We are addicted to convenience. I know this because I'm, I'm dealing with that as well. So, what do we consume just because it's easy or it's a convenience? And I always think, okay, how do my parents live? They did not have bottled water or frozen vegetables or uh, TV dinners. Um, my parents grew up on farms in the Midwest and they started, they, they, when they first, in their earliest years, they farmed with horses. I mean, they didn't even have tractors. So, you know, think about, you know, what are the things that you really need? Um, I know how to sew. I help people mend clothing that, you know, something rips out. It's like, can you fix this? Yeah. Help your friends fix stuff, repair stuff. You know, it's kind of a fun thing to do. And then lastly, recycle. There's uh, essentially nothing is recycled anymore. I hate to tell you this, but recycling is dead. It's all going into landfills now. There's so little stuff that's recycled, um, especially plastics, that it's, it, they don't have any place to send it to. China's not taking it. They, we have too much recycled plastic, and we have no uses for it. So it's going into landfills. If you don't believe me, mm -hmm. uh, check into it. It's carbon, not carbon sequestration. <laughs> it's a different type of carbon sequestration. <laughs> yeah. You take oil, you make plastics, and you put it back in the ground. It'll maybe be oil again someday. Um, uh, and then lastly, this is the one I'm working on right now. Um, I have the pleasure of having money that I have invested. I don't have a lot. But I have, through my, my careers that I've had before, I came to the land trust. I had retirement plans, 401ks. I am going to revisit how and where my money is invested. And it's a little bit harder. But uh, we're doing this with the land trust right now. Um, you know, we have uh, stewardship monies that we have to, that are given to us to that, that are endowments. We can't spend the money, but we need to invest it so that we get a return on investment so that we can do stewardship on the land to get enough money each year to do the stewardship that we need to do on those lands. So we're looking at, you know, and this is a great sort of education for me is that what are the, what are the things that you can invest in? And there's some great things that you can invest in. Uh, Oregon Community Foundation also has, um, you know, for philanthropic folks, um, 
you know, a, a socially and environmentally conscious investment strategy. They're out there. Um, oh, I was going to bring a article. I think I've got it here. Who was it you said had the investment strategies? Huh? Who did you say had the investment strategies? Well, I mean, Oregon Community Foundation is just one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the state of Oregon. And they have an environmentally and socially uh, responsible fund that they have developed. This one, oh, this just blew my mind. Okay, BlackRock, the planet's biggest money manager, announced that it was joining an investor group called Climate Action 100. And they want to make a bigger commitment to taking action on climate change with their investments. Um, this company has seven trillion dollars under management and a third of it is in um, in like sustainable industries so not coal not oil um, it's you know anyway I've got this it's fantastic so I'm probably running out of time all right, so these are some of the things I talked about. What, the one thing that you can do is reduce food waste. Uh, the United States wastes more food, throws away more food, than any other nation in the world. Um, with all those expiration dates and whatnot, buy too much, it's too convenient to go to the store, we buy too much stuff, some of it goes to waste, or we're scared to eat it, we throw it away. That food was produced, uh, processed, transported, and then transported from your home, you know, from the store to your home, and then it gets thrown away. That is a huge, huge waste of transportation and manufacturing. Uh, I just, you know, let's not do that, okay? Um, like I said, eat local as much as you can. Look at your food radius. Um, eat seasonal foods. Uh, don't buy raspberries in January. They're coming from Chile or I don't know where they come from. Um, look at the labels. You know, if something has to get on a plane to arrive here, just don't buy it. Uh, reduce your consumption of beef and dairy. Um, I've changed my dairy to be like more goat. Like goats are better. Um, but I eat a lot of eggs and you know those types of things for protein. Um, I, I can't get off cheese though. I'm like a cheese addict, so uh, you know I'm trying to work through that piece of it. But think about what what food you eat. Where does it come from? And you know. Can you source it locally? Um, you know, light bulbs, reduce energy consumption, um, reduce or eliminate plastics wherever you can, especially single use plastics. Um, you know, I, I get my glass drinks, I only buy, if I buy something in a store, it's glass. Uh, yes, it's got a little bit of plastic in it, but I, I reuse these for water bottles. So, um, and then I can return it and I get my 10 cents back. So, anyway, look at reducing plastics. Plastics are from oil. Um, and oil production is, is one of the dirtiest types of environmental impacts that we have. Fracking, all that stuff. Um, Recycle, repair, repurpose, wherever you can. Um, but, you know, just buy, try to buy less stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I just think that if you can buy something used, do so. Go to the thrift shop. Um, I don't buy brand new jeans anymore. There's like jeans with still the tags on them from the store. At the, I mean, it's like, 
come on, you know, it's they're brand new jeans, but I paid five dollars for them instead. And they're not going to go into a landfill. They're not going to get destroyed and ground up and whatever. Um, a lot of clothing is goes in the landfill. Billions of tons of clothing are just shoved into landfills. So think about that. If you don't know how to sew, I will teach you. I've got a sewing machine. Um, one of the great things that some communities do is that they have like a DIY, you know, day or you know, at the library, and somebody brings in a sewing machine, and somebody else brings in a I don't know, people fix stuff, you know. And, it, and if you got a ripped out seam, it's like, you know, you bring in your sewing machine, you know, somebody will fix it for you. Or hem your pants. Or anyway, those are great community building things. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done here. Awareness, changing habits, these are things that are working. Uh, renewable energy is growing. Businesses and investments are changing how they approach their businesses. They're putting, you know, solar panels on their roofs. They're really, uh, you know, because it makes good business sense. Um, you know, let's have incentives for new energy and pollution standards instead of the regulatory hammer. Um, you know, the Green New Deal can create a new economy, a new workforce, new types of jobs, and have workforce development for our future instead of, you know, the past, or these people not even having jobs. Um, and support natural climate solutions. Uh, look at nature's original carbon sequestration solution. This is, this is the most effective way of sequestering carbon on the planet. Don't wait for some thing, technology to suck CO2 out of the air and make bricks or something. It's just not going to happen. It's going to take too much energy to run that thing, to suck CO2 out of the air, to make your bricks that it's, it's, I don't know, it's kind of not sense. Um, so it's time for action. If you need some ideas, let me know. I, I will help you puzzle through it. I'm here to support you and your community. Um, and let's get started. Um, I just want to talk about the land trust a little bit. Um, like I said, we do conservation work. We do carbon sequestration on natural lands. So um, our service area extends from north of North Bend into Douglas County in the, in the Ten Mile Lakes region, all the way down to the California border. We've got four wild and scenic rivers. This is a special place to protect. Um, and we have 12 watersheds. So we work with a lot of different partners. Typically, watersheds are managed by one organization. So all of those watersheds, we're working with a lot of different partners in trying to um, do this type of restoration work or conservation work. And we've done six projects, 860 acres conserved. Um, I'm thinking that in the next year and a half, we might double that. So we're on a roll. Um, if you'd like to support us, great. But these things are fantastic. I love doing these types of forums. I love doing outreach and education. Uh, if you'd like us to sponsor a movie, we do, um, there's a, a movie flyer back there for Gold Beach and other places. I'd love to do them here too. But we have other ways to help support our work. And if you'd like to do us to do more of this, um, you know, put some gas money in the, in the donation thing so I can cover my, cover my that. Or, or host a house party or talk to your friends that might be interested. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say we're here to stay. We recently were accredited is a long two-year process. Um, they dive into our finances, our governance, um, our ethical conduct, um, our ability to do long-term stewardship, and we got the check marks. And so we're here to stay. Um, we're committed to working with our communities and individuals here. So um, 
uh, it's just, uh, we got this in August, so pretty excited. Good presentation. It's interesting she was talking about individual things that we can each do. And then another thing we say is we need to, to talk to our representatives. And we have David Brock Smith here tonight who dropped in. David's involved in the, the sequestration bill. Is that right? Yes, sir. Fits in perfectly. Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah. I'd love to. If that's okay. Dan, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, David, for coming. It's so good to see you. Thanks. <clears throat> so I, I spoke to many of you before when I came to the SoCan meeting before. Um, so I drafted a House Bill 4151. So what Ann had, there was a slide that you had up there that showed the U.S. Um, and the emissions. And the emissions. Uh, in Oregon, we're a little different uh, because we uh, get a lot of our energy from hydro. Uh, and of course, turbines and dows and so forth. And so our biggest emitter in the state is transportation. Um, and a lot of that transportation comes from the, the urban areas of the state. Uh, in fact, transportation emissions in the state of Oregon are greater than agriculture, industrial, um, residential, commercial combined. Uh, and so there's a cap and trade legislation that is moving forward in the legislature that focuses on agriculture, industrial, and um, residential, commercial, natural gas, uh, I drafted House Bill 4151, which focuses on transportation. More importantly, it focuses on incentivizing. I love your, your comment. Let's not, let's start incentivizing rather than, than uh, how'd you put it? Start incentivizing so rather than right regulating with hammer. a hammer. I love that. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, and so what 4151 does is there's roughly, there's over 1.4 million registered passenger vehicles in the Tri-County area alone in Portland. So you have Multnomah, Clackamas, Washington counties. Uh, there's only about around 27,000 electric vehicles registered statewide. Um, and <clears throat> so in the 17 transportation package that was passed in the state, there was a privilege tax that was associated with it. And that privilege tax is a privilege for you to go buy a new vehicle. Uh, you pay a privilege tax to do that. And then that tax funds EV incentives statewide. And so what 4151 does is it increases the privilege tax within the Metro uh, Service District of Portland to help incentivize and, and, and increase the EV incentives within the Metro uh, Service area of Portland to assist in transitioning my goal is 25,000 a year of those 1.4 million registered vehicles to EVs. Um, somebody with uh, an income that is less than 120% of area median income within the metro area of Portland will receive a collective $10,000 EV rebate, not including manufacturer, not including federal, uh, which makes it a lot easier for them to transition into an electric vehicle. But the other part of the problem with EV is charging. Now we did good work on the, on the, on the chair of the, the Coastal Caucus, um, and we were able to move forward and get over $10 million in what we call the West Coast Electric Highway for charging infrastructure up and down the coast of Oregon. When I still had my restaurant, I wanted to put in a, put in a charging station, a fast charge station, because I had three phase there. Um, was about $25,000, but I want those Tesla drivers to be able to stop, stop. and charge. Um, anyway, but when it comes to the charging infrastructure, not just statewide, but also in Portland, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist down to the transformer on the pole on the corner of the street. I mean, you have to imagine those, those two-phase chargers are like adding another dryer in your own. And so what the other part of the bill does is it has the PUC or Public Utility Commission uh, work with PGE and Pacific Power to roll out the needed charging infrastructure and grid modernization within uh, uh, the Portland metro area um, so that we can have those charging stations and then they can recoup those costs uh, on the rates within those same air Portland metro area uh, folks. Um, it's 
it will reduce emissions greatly um, if we're able to transition those uh, passenger vehicles to EVs. It's hard to calculate exactly. So of those 1.46 million registered passenger vehicles, they travel about 9,400 miles a year. But in trying to compute what those emissions are in those 9,400 miles a year are difficult because a lot of that is in stop and go traffic. You know, I live in Port Orford. I can get here in 60, in 60, 65 minutes, right? Well, you try to go, you, you go 10 miles in Portland at a certain given time, and my brother lives in Hillsborough, it's a nightmare. Right? But at a certain time of day, it takes you 60 minutes to go those 10 miles. And so all that time, you have emissions that are coming out of your tailpipe. So when you, that 9,600 or 9,400 miles a year is not, you can't really compute apples to apples with, with those emissions. So the emissions of transitioning uh, those folks to EVs in the metro area of Portland would dramatically reduce uh, the transportation emissions in the state. Uh, graphs already show that ag emissions, you're right, no-till soils are fantastic. Um, uh, coastal wetland, wetlands and, and marshes are fantastic at sequestration. Seaweed, fantastic at sequestration. But David, what about truck traffic? That's the biggest problem we have here. Is everything has to be brought here or taken away from here? What about electric trucks and mass transit? I mean, it, it's great for Portland. They should have more mass transit. But what about here? So um, we have Curry Coastal Express as far as public transit. Um, that infrastructure is a long way away. Electric trucks are, you know, they're coming along. Um, the weights uh, needed to carry are, you know, I mean, they're getting better. The batteries are, we, ha we, ha we have to have a balance. I think we all would agree, right? So, um, the city of Portland, Portland or it's called Metro, or excuse me, <coughs> not, it's not Metro, they, they get upset about that. It's, it's called uh, uh, TriMet. TriMet is the public transit system for Portland me metro area. They have over 700 diesel buses that they run every day. Um, and they, um, they, they're moving towards five electric buses partnering with PG. Five. Because of the cost. But more importantly, the infrastructure and energy to charge those batteries on those electric buses is massive. Um, so, not to mention, the carbon footprint creating those batteries is massive as well, right? I mean, so, but over time, the, the balance is there where over time they are uh, more environmentally. You know. And then when you add other regulations that we passed in the state, clean fuels, we've passed uh, coal to clean, we'll have coal free carbon uh, um, in the state, but we just had a report in our Energy and Environment Committee last week during legislative days that there are concerns because we went to coal to clean. Just because we aren't producing uh, you, uh, energy out of Boardman anymore with coal doesn't mean we still don't need the energy, if not more, and we haven't supplanted it with anything, so now we're buying energy from other producers outside of the state. Yeah, we actually get a fair amount of our energy from coal plants in Wyoming. No. So we are still not really a step up. It, no. we're, we're still not there yet. Correct. <laughs> but, one of the, but there was a, a huge investment for, um, <coughs> excuse me, in um, natural gas storage for uh, burning natural gas for energy um, until batteries <coughs> I mean another reason let me let me shift another reason why I chose Portland is not only because that's where the emissions are coming from and I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to avoid your question it's just difficult when it comes to you know I mean Brookings is you know I mean we have we have 22,350 people that live in Curry County. And so, um, it's difficult when, you know, I, I, what I worry when it comes to the big cap and trade bill is the cost of, of that shirt or that apple or that good that you spoke about in transportation and bringing it down, right? 
And so it's, uh, it's, there's always problems with regards to, and then when you add that cost, the punitive cost, rather than, right, then the, with the, um, with the gas tax that's associated with the cap and trade bill, you're going to add more costs to the good at the end of the line. But one of the things... By local. That's right. <laughs> so my other bill, actually, is a local, it's a meat processing bill, right? Okay. So, um, you know, you got mobile ranch butchers up, yep. up, up in... Yep. Uh, and uh, there's, so folks that raise cattle or brookings or sheep, the involves. Yep. You got to you got to transport them to the closest place to have them inspected to be able to sell commercially is Mohawk Meats in Springfield, and that transportation costs and the emissions associated with it are huge. And so there's a federal law that allows state employees to be USDA certified, and so that's one step, and that's what uh, my, my other bill does, 4152, and and then in 21 um, we're going to have resources once we have ODA employees. Uh, go through the process. We'll have resources to help the mobile ranch butchering, and we have about eight strategically, geographically located around the state, eastern Oregon, uh, and so forth, where we can help them invest in upgrading their facilities to be USDA certi uh, certified and, and inspected. And so the thought is the ODA employer can be abandoned processing, uh, you know, 20 uh, wall sheep on Tuesday. And then in Pendleton processing uh, and inspecting on Thursday, and then at Klamath Falls on Monday, so that we can eat more. It drives me nuts that I'm up in Port Orford, and some of the best sheep in the world are grown on. on, on she's right, I've toured Walls Grasslands. It's amazing what they're doing there. There's a little article back there, very interesting. Yeah, and I wish, you know, I mean, and that was how farming was done pre-World War II, when they started moving, when, when was it pre-World War, no, pre-World War I, when they, when, when, what did they need for, they, they needed all those nitrogen for bombs, but now they use it for fertilizer, yeah. in essence. Yeah. And so, that's what they used, that's how they used to farm. If it was up to me, we'd take that wood waste and slash in the forest, and we would biochar it, and yes. we would rail it to the Midwest and use it as soil amendments rather than nitrogen-based fertilizers. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then we protect the Gulf. And okay, Agricultural Heritage uh, Program. Program. Mm -hmm. Is that going to move this year? I believe it is. I'm signed on as a sponsor. I know you are. Thank you. You were early about her. What I'm upset is I helped get... I helped increase farm to school to $13 million, and then Port Orford didn't get its grant. Kathy didn't get its grant. I know. Anyway, so the the ag folks um, will be able to process locally, and it's um, I didn't finish, but it's upsetting. I've got wall wall sheep right up the road, and I go to Ray's Market in town, and it's from New Zealand, right? Right. So you can get it at the Port Orford Co-op. Yes. Yeah. Um, but those are my two pieces of legislation. I'm spot people come to me and want me to sponsor their legislation. There's other legislation I'm on. Uh, we're on a I'm on a bill <coughs> to um, to limit um, um, the cost of insulin to $100 uh, for folks in the state um, and and others. But I, and I've just recently, since we don't have a joint committee on carbon reduction anymore, uh, the speaker has appointed me to the Energy Environment Committee. So um, I'm on the Energy Environment Committee, the Agricultural Land Use Committee, and the Natural Resources Committee. So everything in this we are. Uh, you mentioned the coastal corridor. Coastal Is that electrons. part of one? Yep. So that's a good thing. Um, the other question I had, let's see. I'll cut back to you. I can't remember the other right now. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I thank you for the, I'm happy to answer any questions. Real, I just have a quick one. Are you getting bipartisan support? Oh, with so your bills? thank you very much. Sure. So uh, yes, uh, in fact, my um, I, I can't forget. Maybe you can help me with a name for for the um, for the EV bill for the metro area. I I thought about calling it the Metro um, Reduction of Carbon Bill or Mercy, right? Mercy. <laughs> 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 but I didn't like that very much. So I, I don't know. My chief of staff wants to. I can't remember what she wants to. But uh, 
They're, they're very important in the building. So are the numbers. I'm glad I got 41 and 51 because it's easy to remember. So it's the, only, it's the only carbon reduction bill that has bipartisan bicameral support. So I have 14 Democrats signed on to the bill and 13 Republicans on the bill. Um, and, and Democrats that uh, are actually represented in their districts are within the metro area of Portland. Uh, spoke, the speaker called me yesterday and, and brought it up again and quote, she, she loves my bill. So we'll see. I mean, it's not meant to supplant uh, the cap and trade bill. I have a lot of problems with the cap and trade bill. I still am, am digesting it. I, I need to, to, to get into it. I'll be offering a number of amendments. Uh, we only have 35 days in session. Right. Um, so, uh, but it's uh, it's meant to deal with the transportation sector that the cap and trade bill does not. So the other question was about the rebate on EV. Mm -hmm. um, when can that get to the rural areas? Is there a reason why it can't be extended that far? So the reason why I, I so you already have an EV rebate with a, so um, somebody that makes less than 120,000, 120% of area median income now is eligible for a $5,000 EV rebate. You have a $2,500 EV rebate for the under 120% and a $2,500 EV rebate for um, the privilege tax statewide. This increases that by five just for the metro area. I left it, I, because our electric utilities across the state are so diverse, mm -hmm. um, deal, only dealing with the two big IOUs, we call them, investor-owned utilities, yeah. was the easiest. And because of their density in Portland for grid modernization, and so when I first took office in 17, I supported uh, Representative Barnhart's legislation that would allow any tenant in any renting, any apartment complex or anywhere to be able to put in an EV charging uh, unit uh, in their, you know, at their rental or parking spot, which but before then was not allowed. Um, and so it's easier in the grid modernization piece, you can also use those resources to put solar on the carports that are on all those car parking infrastructures. Um, and you can get to the smart grid. So I, I was at a conference a few months ago uh, for conservative um, legislators nationally that are support renewable energy in LA and was able to, to um, ride in a Tesla to a tech hub and view a smart home. Um, and the ability for those things to integrate are, is better in Portland. And, and so I'm not opposed, and I've already talked to uh, colleagues who have asked the same question, that come 2023, after we have this program in place, after we know how it's working and the transition, then other areas or other cities or counties can then opt in to the program um, and so forth. Because the way the privilege tax works is, is quite elegant in the fact that it's where you register your vehicle. So it doesn't matter if you, if you live here and buy a car in Portland, you don't, you're, you don't have to pay the added tax. You, you, you have to pay your state privilege tax, but not the added tax. If you live in Portland and you buy it here, you would have to pay it because it's where it's registered, or if you buy it in Idaho, or if you buy it in Washington. Yeah. And the way that the tax structures are focused, you can't increase the registration fee because those are subject to the Constitution and the Highway Trust Fund. So, and this is not. Can you give me those numbers again for the, the, the rural um, EV rebate? Uh, uh, something about so you have um, so you have um, uh, you have a twenty five hundred dollar statewide EV rebate, and then if you uh, make less than one hundred twenty percent of area median income, you have an additional twenty five. You could you could be eligible for an additional twenty five hundred dollar EV rebate. Make one hundred twenty percent of I'm uh, sorry of area median income. Less than median income. Okay. So that would be like Curry County median income. Correct. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Any news on the wind front? Off coast wind? Mm -hmm. No. Um, not at this time. I. Uh, yeah. There's. It's. It's. They're. They're still talking about it. Um, we'll have more conversations and meetings when we get into uh, session next month. We start February 3rd. I think we have to be done by the 9th. I think it is. 
Thank you very much, Thank and you. thanks for letting me have a talk. So we officially are supposed to end at 7, but Ed has finagled it, so we have a key. So Ann, <laughs> you, you no doubt have questions for Ann and David, if you can right, stick around. This is, yeah. this is great. We don't want to kick you out, because the conversations are really what it's about. You were talking about personal choices, and then all the way up to what David can do, and statewide, and you know, talk to your representatives, make your opinions, make your interests known. Clearly, you are listening to it. One thing, one thing about Brookings is that we've got a very diverse community here, but I would be willing to wager that virtually everybody here loves the ocean, and loves the forest, and loves the outdoors. They are we're surrounded by environmentalists. So in fact, we want to preserve it. So, as you were saying, talk, civil conversations. Yeah. Expect that you all have a way more, common, way more in common with all the people around you than you have differences. And don't let those differences stop the conversations. Those are the ones that are important. We're still working on the option. So I'm working with Tom colleagues uh, and possibly getting the, the um, there's that strain of seaweed. Yep. And see if we can grow it at the Port of Port Orford. And, uh, and use it on cattle to see if we can reduce emissions. If we can grow it here. And we're having, we're, we're I'm, I'm working with the uh, uh, folks on getting the otter back. Yep. Um, and then of course we have the urchin issue and the kelp beds that we're, that we're working on as well. And it's all kinds of stuff. And seaweed's a great fertilizer. Yeah. It by is. Way. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share with the group, if you don't already know, in terms of local resources for buying food locally. Otter Bees Online is just wonderful because they have a very small area. I think they go as far as uh, Glenloy um, and down to the, just past, down to Fort Dix. And everything is within that radius. Yeah. So that's a, a good place to yeah. check for local food. So yeah, share, you know, share information with each other. Um, you know, the, I, I feel blessed to live in Port Orford because we have all of these great local food options. We have the sustainable fisheries that I just signed up for, so I'll get my, I put my $100 credit in, and so I can go buy my, my sustainably harvested fish. Um, and we have Valley Flora, which is a beautiful farm, um, and they have summer programs, and they also have winter produce as well. They, they have it going all the time. Um, and then, you know, the locally produced meats. Um, we have grass-fed beef, and we have, have a, the, the wonderful lamb that, that is produced there. So, you know, stop in if you're up in Port Orford. The Port Orford Co-op is open Wednesday through Sunday. And um, they have Valley Flora produce. They have wall lamb sold there. So those are some great local things. Of course, you're getting 100 miles, or, you know, you're getting at least, you know, 60, 70 miles radius. But, but look at and see how tight you can get that radius. Of, and it keeps those dollars here. All those people that produce eggs and vegetables, and, um, they all live here. And they need that money more than other people do. So uh, just support that. Can I see your slide one more time of the, the numbers of the, the graph of uh, carbon emissions that each thing produces? Sure. And I, wouldn't, I didn't get all your seven R's either. <laughs> I was trying to write them. Let's find the seven R's. There they There's are. That. Oh, there yeah. Go. Hey, you can find this stuff online. Um, that's where I find it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have one question? Yeah. Oh, well, well she's looking at yeah. this. Um, you're talking about that trees don't really sequester until they're like 40 years old. Oh, they sequester, but they're, they emit more CO2 as a living organ speaking, organism yeah. than the they sequester. The so when they get 30, 40 years old, they sequester more carbon than they produce. So that as a living means you're thinking organism. that all this time, all this time we're telling people to plant trees are actually adding the problem to the next no, 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 no. Because they will grow up to be the case. Yeah, so that's 40 yeah. years from now. I'm talking about what are we going to do right now? We got, we got, you know, hundreds of years to, to turn this around. So, so the, the, but the, yeah. the living is what she's talking about, but then that living does um, sequester into the ground right. and adds nitrogen and fertilizer for the, yeah. for the tree to grow. Um, this might be an area where we might disagree a little bit on. We, we disagree a little bit on this, but I, 
we don't need to harvest everything. Agreed. I, I, I agree with that. And I think that we need to, um, instead of creating little museums of trees, that we need to, to build some landscape level forests that have healthy soil. It, you know, we can talk about the trees, but the soil that those trees are, have is incredibly thick and dense. And when you harvest those trees, all that stuff washes away. And it takes centuries to, to develop that soil again. So I want us to think about forest and We don't need to harvest everything. Maybe we can, re in some areas, change the rotation time, have them grow to 50 years. Uh, it, some, you know, let's figure out some ways to optimize these systems so that they can do a better job for us. So the Oregon Department of Forestry, um, at, at my request, and Senator Rob Milden, who drafted the bill, in 2018 did a forest carbon study, sink study. And so that's available if you go to the Oregon Department of Forestry's website. Um, and 31 million metric tons of carbon are sequestered by our forest annually in Oregon statewide. They're doing a forest carbon, and that was the forest carbon stock assessment. Now they, they, they're in the midst of almost finishing the study with regards to the uh, processing of that. So, you know, you have the stick, right? And yep. so, um, and, she, and she's, uh, uh, and so they're in the process of, of that sequestration benefit as well. And we should have that data hopefully within the next month or two. Um, um, and it's something that I wanted, you know, a lot when we first started talking about this conversation in 17. Uh, because we need that data. Uh, for example, um, I know more about this stuff than I ever wanted. Um, so the grass seed industry in the state, because we are in the grass seed in the capital of the world, sequesters <laughs> over 2.3 million metric tons of carbon annually. Just that, just the grass seed industry alone in this state. Wow. And so, you know, we have uh, lots of opportunities. Um, and the, the forests are, are one that, uh, with the, there's new data and studies that show that, yes, that during those times they are sequestering, um, but then when they reach, what is it, 80, 85 uh, years old, 90 years old, they start their sequester. Um, um, ratio starts plateauing. Yeah, but I, you know, there's there's a lot more going on with those trees, like I said, than just what's above the ground. Of course. There's a lot of stuff going on underneath the ground. There's uh, fungi, and all, you know, there's all these bacteria. There's a whole bunch of stuff that is pulling carbon from those trees, and it's pulling it into the soil very deeply. Um, the one point that I'd like to make is that a lot of times what frustrates me is that um, these industries tend to operate sort of in silos. And I want, I want them to connect that clear-cutting forests damages our fisheries. That's right. And these are intimately linked. Um, and this is how I got into this line of work is when I was a wee little thing, my dad was a fly fisherman, and he had PTSD from World War II. We didn't know what that was at the time, but he needed his nature therapy. So he took us kids and toads to go play, you know, poke at the dying salmon in the streams, you know, while I fish. And it was a matter of like five, less than 10 years, there, the fish were gone. I grew up in the Puget Sound area. And everything was clear cut. They did not replant anything at that time. There's no requirements to replant. Um, and my dad lost his nature therapy, and it got it got bad at home because he, you know, he didn't have his outlet. So um, I think, and that's another point. We need these places not just for what we monetize. We need it for, you know, our souls and our heads. Uh, to keep us screwed on well. Uh, there's a lot of people that struggle with trauma from war and other things that find um, solace and, and, and connection in, the, in our natural world. And 
you can't monetize that. So the, the in Curry County, 1,648 square miles, 67 percent is owned by the federal government, therefore national forest. 22 uh, percent is private timberland, 7 percent is farmland, 4, uh, 1 percent state, and we have about four or four and a half percent that's economically developable land where you can build a house. Um, on the national landscape, there is no clear cut. There, there, there's lots of funding projects. Um, on the private timber land, they can only clear cut under the Oregon Forest Practices Act 120 acres uh, in a timber sale. So we have a great, it's not like it was when your dad was there. We have, yeah. we have laws in place to uh, protect fisheries. I, and, I would and, and, encourage and, to increase those buffers. Well, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not opposed yeah. to having a conversation about about um, uh, about buffers. I, I remember many of you remember when I ran for county commissioner and we talked about the the plan for the, um, the, the the forest activity where you did have wildlife corridor buffers um, along our streams in, in the county. And I've always been supportive of that, and, and so is the industry actually for the most part. The uh, one of the things that ties back into our carbon sequestration conversation. And in and, 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 uh, stream health is fire. And the fact that, you know, we're, we had 192,000 acre check bar fire. I don't know how many of you have been up there to see the burn. It is a marble burn. But now you have shrubs growing in there, and there's no replanting that's occurring across the national fire burn landscape. Not any replanting. And so if they're we're trying, they're trying to see what is going to re regenerate naturally but as the plant. But if we only have 11 years to make a difference, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for 500 years for the forest to be natural, it's ridiculous. You know, because in, in my opinion, it is. There's, there's, you know, how are we going to? I always think about. And yeah, I mean, you can look at the biscuit fire and see shrubs yeah. as well. But, yeah. but, but, I always think about how are we going to keep our kids healthy? How are we going to? If you don't mind me asking, so. You're one of the other ones in the room. But, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, how do we? How how um, are you out of are you out of school? Are you yeah. college? And, yeah. And and so. Graduated ten years. And so. From high school. Yeah. So. I don't know what brings you. What kept you here? I came back. Yes. Yeah. Family. As did I, as did I. And uh, I want there to be jobs associated with. The folks that uh, go to school, get their degree, and be able to come back. And I, I say this publicly a lot. There's only so many bedpans in Curry County, and, <laughs> but it's the case. I mean, there's, there's, there's. We can't, re we cannot survive as a retirement county and community. We have to be able to, and, and that's demographic and social welfare across the state. I mean, you all, I'm sure, support our schools a lot, but there's a lot of folks that say. In, in older communities, you know what, my kids have grown up, I don't want to vote for that levy. They don't need a new gym, you know, because they don't want, because they've already put their kids through school, and that's, that's shameful, really. And so, when the Forest Service had, had 850, Siskiyou Road, Siskiyou had 850 jobs prior to uh, the 90s, and now they have about 250. You know, I would like to see us be proactive. If we know that there's changing conditions across the landscape, we don't have time to wait to see what happens and grows up there because we know it's going to be Dano. And we have, what do we have? Sudden Oak Death, just had a task force <laughs> meeting up in Bandon uh, last, uh, uh, yesterday. And so why can't we bring, why can't we be proactive? And if we know that there's these changing conditions are occurring, why are we not planning a diverse forest landscape across the national system that we know is going to be uh, resilient with the changing conditions and then have the resources then to have those kids and those ology jobs come back Absolutely. and manage those resources for us in the future and be able to afford to live and raise their families. You know, 67 you know, that would be a really great um, potentially senior project or internships, any kind of thing, uh, community college level for kids to get out and do. I was just talking with one of the ladies about helping out with senior projects and they've got a few different field trips and things that they're doing for kids to start looking at, you know, stuff like that, but to bring up some ideas like that. I, I, Carl might remember this. I said this when I was a county commissioner. 
You know, I mean, it's, it's just frustrating because if, if we know things are changing, and it goes to the core of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to do. Why aren't we being more proactive on the larger scale? And it's it, 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 I, it's the federal it, government. I, 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 no, I, it, but, it, but it was the prior one too. Yeah, but yeah, there's there's been fewer there's fewer jobs, there's fewer federal jobs because of the the, the budget constraints. Um, one point I would like to make is that. If you go back and you look at old photographs, aerial photographs of this area, especially up in the in the mountains, there were huge meadow areas. Yep. And you look at them now, and they have trees. Yep. So we have, um, and you, know, and I, you know, you'll think I'm crazy, but we have a preponderance of trees because of site fire. Uh, because of fire suppression. That's right. Um, and how the native peoples managed lands as well, because they did burns. Um, so I would say, what are we restoring our forest to? Is it an unnaturally overstocked um, treed area that is not sustainable as far as fire is concerned for this area? This is one of the things where... So maybe we shouldn't replant those areas and let Maybe put some artificial meadows. But the, but the shrubs aren't good. Let's really. not engineer it, though. I know. I mean, I, I'm kind of, you know, I, humans, I'm you know. I'm totally following both of you, and I feel like there's a really great debate here that there I think is. that we should ask the people who have been doing this for a long time. Um, I talked with a group of people down in Kansas City that are the Native Americans of that area down there. I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the name. You're are doing some yes, incredible things down there. Yeah. You know, look at people that if we can get some people together and say, what is the right. fine line here of what is doable financially, what is naturally acceptable, right. and, and is there some kind of agreement that is there anything that we should do? Because I mean, to help nature, but we also don't want to force something that shouldn't be there. But you know, what are we restoring this to? Are we restoring it to something that um, maybe fine. never existed <laughs> before? or right. um, isn't sustainable. is not sustainable and is not sustainable with the, the current weather conditions that we have. So I just want to kind of open up the debate a little bit to say maybe these areas, oh, there used to be sheep herders. They used to take, I mean, these, these were ranch. Mm -hmm. People would herd all their sheep up into the mountains and they'd feed on these meadows. Those meadows are gone. So, you know, what are we restoring to? And I think we really need to talk about that. Absolutely. One of the, one of the things that... So, to, just saying. To, no, I, I, I agree to a point. One of the things <laughs> that we need, we need to do... I, 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 I encourage you to look up Era Megafire on YouTube. Um, and it's Dr. Paul Hesburgh, who is a, a world-renowned forester out of Washington. And he says we have an epidemic of trees because of fire suppression. Right. Fully agree. Um, my the and, and I and I understand the, the thought process around you know fire and natural and the fires um, it, it burns everything. And so maybe that's not where we need that meadow because it's not good for the soil. It's not good for. They break up the fire. You know, and so forth. Be a fire break. You know, and so maybe we need those meadows created in other areas and the replant in other areas and so forth. And, and we can be prescriptive. We have the ability to do the, that. The problem that I have with the replanting is that usually it's replanted with monoculture. Mm -hmm. But I don't want yeah, that. I said diverse forest landscape. Yeah. But, know, but so. the people that do that don't know how to do that. But that's why we need those all jobs. So Thank we can you. Have those <laughs> they don't do it. So, anyway, I I love talking to David because we we agree on a lot of different things, and he has been a great proponent for. I called him up for the Oregon Ag Agricultural Heritage yeah. Program, and he said, "Yes, I will help sponsor that bill." And I was like, oh, yes. "Big supporter of the, of the uh, well, it was the upper like, right the wild well, and so." Um, you know, I, I love having our little tests here, so. Uh, but, I mean, these are the types of things that um, I want to kind of open up the conversation a little bit. I don't know everything. I don't want to say that I'm an expert in any of this because I'm not. 
Um, but I think that uh, we have changing conditions, we have a, a century of fire suppression, and I think that we kind of, we're not quite sure what, you know, what we need to do. Um, and so I just, I, I want to acknowledge that because I, I think that we have, we live in unprecedented times. It's hot and dry, and boy, those winds here um, during the summertime dry everything out. And it's, I hate to say it, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's true. Um, and we were really lucky last year. So, um, you know, stay engaged on this topic. I want, I want to make sure that we, we support our fisheries through good forest management. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I wish we could increase those, those stream buffers. We have unusual topography here. We have very steep slopes, um, especially in the south in Curry County. Up in Coos County, it's, you know, kind of more rolling hills and different soils. And, uh, but down here on the south part of the coast, we have extremely steep slopes. And that, that soil just gets washed out it's very one, quickly. It's one of the problems with the road and the sediment buildup of yeah. the road because of the dam and then fires. And, you know, you have all those tributaries. Timber harvest. <laughs> they, go the, they go over the road and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I won't, I won't, I, I won't okay. uh, disagree that, you know, that timber harvest does not yeah. uh, deal with sediment, but so do fires, and, and fires deal with sediment as well. And so we were able to get 456000 for a road sediment study at Camp Perry, it was great. Yep. And, and uh, so we're, we're trying to make proactive steps to yeah. And and I'm I'm loving this conversation. I appreciate it. <laughs> we are too. Yeah. <laughs> um, me, where can I look at your information on the four one by one health bill? Like accurate. Go 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 to the authority. Yeah. Go to Olus. It's called Oregon Legislative Information System. It will not be available until on Olus until it is first read on February third. Dot uh, org or gov. Go. Go. You just Google Oregon Legislative and Information System. Slight tangent here. Well, last time we tried to pass the cap and trade type bill, we had all these truckers show up and be demonstrating. And I mean, do you see any way to uh, facilitate a better conversation there because they feel like their livelihood is going to go away and so forth? Well, those are the amendments that we're trying to, that will work into the legislation um, as we tried to before. There was over 120 amendments in the last bill. This bill is 50, 40 pages longer. Wow. Um, it's 148 page bill, I think, 158 pages. Um, there will be another timber, timber unity rally on February 6th. Uh, there's folks who are coming to the Capitol on that day. Um, so can you maybe hit a high point or two of how these amendments are going to make them happier? I don't know if I, you know, I don't know if they'll make them happy or not. Okay. Um, you know it's the transportation sector so yes. I work hard to exempt I, I worked hard to exempt um, uh, ag and, and, and log trucks from the uh, tax associated with the, with the cap and trade bill. Um, so when you're in the minority party, um, you don't get your amendment, you know, amendment number 27, right? When when they, they when they adjust the bill, your amendments just get slipped in to the new, you know, version of the bill. So there was a number of amendments that I was able to get the get those uh, log truck and ag truck uh, fuels uh, out of. Um, I was able to get the um, uh, state lands out of the um, um, the carbon credit program uh, because those uh, state forest lands are important to, um, especially in the North Coast. Um, so we're going to have, we'll just, I, I really haven't gone through the bill in, in a, with a fine tooth comb yet um, to start requesting amendments and all start that probably this weekend. Thank you. Sure.
As you walk out, I printed out a, an article from the New York Times. It's called Effortless Environment, Environmentalism. And it's just got some very quick points. Um, so grab one of those or look it up online. Um, so there's some materials back there. If you want to get on our mailing list, um, please sign up. There's a sign up sheet back there if you'd like to uh, get our, our newsletters and find out what's going on with the land trust. Um, please do so. There's one more thing, and I, I am for you as well, because you know, so the plastic recycling is a huge problem. She's right, it's going to, you know, I still want to go into McDonald's and get a McFlurry in a plastic cup with a plastic leg in there. <coughs> plastic straw. You know, I'm, I'm a little frustrated about the straw bill because it doesn't, even some of the uh, proponents of it didn't want it to pass because it, it, we don't have straw problems in the ocean. It's, they're coming from Asia. I mean, that's, that's where the plastics are coming from. But, um, when it comes to recycling, uh, I met a gentleman who um, used to be involved with a company out of California that they would take in the plastics and then they would transform them into irrigation hose um, instead of concrete uh, you know um, road oh, dividers oh, yeah. they were they were forming the recycled plastic into those concrete road dividers um, and I'm wondering if there's not an opportunity uh, for us in Oregon to have businesses like that as startups but nobody's making any money on recycling. They, they can't make any money That's on it. Problem. That's the problem. Yeah. Well, no, but if they were able to take the plastic to use as their material to then create another product, so rather than using concrete, which are very carbon-intensive center dividers, which you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. They, they use, they take recycled uh, plastic and create those. They might need they to might. give somebody. You know, incentives, incentives. To, to do that. Well, I'm, I'm money not money. incentives. I'm not um, the hammer. I'm, I'm also involved with the League of Women Voters, voters of Curry County, and um, I'm going to pull the group together. I am going to do this. I, think, uh, I said we need to do a study around this, and as well as. Um, Looking at the, I, I just, it's like a recycling debacle. Mm -hmm. um, when China started, stopped taking, um, you know, our, our garbage essentially. Um, <laughs> um, and, and they just so happen to be like dumping it into the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's why we have these giant rafts of plastic. Mm -hmm. um, now it's not even, you know, they're not accepting it, and no one else will accept it. It's going into landfills. So that's why I'm just saying, just don't buy this stuff. It's so uh, I mean, how do you buy a loaf of bread that isn't right. in a plastic bag? Uh, go, to the go to the bakery. Go to the bakery here in town. There's a great bakery, and get your loaf of bread yeah. not in, that doesn't have to be put on a truck and brought. Buy stuff mm -hmm. that you can buy locally. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, yeah, Dave's so, is great, but it, it gets on a truck and it comes from several hundred miles away. So. Yeah, or make your own. Make your own bread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been, I, I love to cook. I've never been much of a baker because I, you know, the instant gratification. If you, if you mess up on the pork chop, you can fix it. If you mess up on the cheesecake, it takes hours. To <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm I you know I'm here to be a resource for you. There's cards back there. Um, you know, if you want to get other groups together to talk about you know continuing this conversation around how do we kind of change some of the habits that we have, um, please you know just reach out to me and I, I'd love to participate or, or serve as a resource. So I just want to say you know great conversation on yes. how, how to what do we do.